Welcome back to America's Commercial Real Estate Show. I'm Michael Wolf. Thank you for being with us. This segment is brought to you by BOMI.org. That's B-O-M-I.org. They are the industry standard in facilities and property management education. Check them out. Well, today we're talking about multifamily, and I think one of the things that adds strength to the multifamily market is the financing, the readily available financing that multifamily tends to always have. But uh, there are some changes in the market. We're seeing interest rates rise. We're seeing some, some good supply levels in some markets. So what does that mean to financing? What does that mean to underwriting? What does that mean to interest rates? We have an expert in uh, the Studio One here with you today, Tom Walsh. He is Senior VP with Grandbridge, and they are BB&T's Commercial Mortgage Banking Subsidiary, and he's here in Studio One. Tom, thanks for being with us again. Nice to be here again, Michael. So, Tom, I think my first question for my audience is, about underwriting, you know, it seems like when I, when I listen to Brian Bailey at the Fed talk about, you know, kind of the new supply and multifamily, I look at some of the cities we work in, like Atlanta, I see a lot of cranes, a lot of new supply. How are lenders looking at the multifamily sector in general right now? Uh, there is certainly some concern about supply. Uh, it's somewhat limited to more urban or semi-urban core locations. Uh, what we would you know call around here the in town inside the perimeter market, which a, a lot of cities have a similar situation to that. By and large, uh, we have not built a lot of apartments in suburbia since the recession. The, uh, all, all over the country, most of the building has been in the urban locations, and that, based on kind of what's where the millennials like to live, and the, the, those have become the live, work, play, walking areas. But there are several cities in the country where supply is a concern. Uh, for lenders and they're watching that very carefully. Yeah, so are they changing their underwriting standards because of that or is it just on maybe those in-town class A markets? It's, it, it's probably more in, in how people view construction loans. Uh, yeah. I haven't seen in the permanent market yet really much reaction to that. But in the those, those properties are stable. Aren't yes, it? yes. Yeah. In the construction, uh, that industry though, yeah, there were certainly um, a, a very jaded eye sometimes on, on a lot of properties um, and, and just trying to be careful the regulators uh, you know, most of your construction lending is done by banks mm -hmm. still and obviously they're regulated and, and the regulators uh, are, are bound and determined that the 2007 to 2009 situation is not going to happen again and so they watch very carefully how people are underwriting their construction loans and that they don't get what we call too far out over their skis, really, just you know, too much exposure. Um, so it, it, it has caused a slowdown in construction lending. I think it's harder to get a loan, mm -hmm. but it's certainly not impossible, as evidenced by cranes, a lot of places. Yeah. And what is the equity requirement change that you've seen from maybe three or four years ago to today for a construction loan? A, a, a lot of deals are done these days with uh, say 60 to 65 percent of cost construction loans. Mm -hmm. uh, the time uh, of, of people getting 75, 88, 85 percent of cost mm -hmm. in the market, that doesn't really happen from the lending perspective. And in all reality, uh, there doesn't seem to be much desire even in the borrowing sector for that. I, I think people are trying to be safer, taking a longer term approach to things and, and keeping your debt a little more manageable yeah. is one way to do that. The exception would be those people doing HUD financing, where 80 to 83 percent of cost financing is still readily available. Um, you know, HUD takes a kind of a unique situation and a unique borrower because of the time frame involved, but still a very viable option you know, you know, for people that have the time and have their land under control. For new construction? Yes, and, for new construction. And will some of these lenders uh, with these loan to value ratios uh, allow MES financing? Um, it depends on your construction lender. Uh, there are construction lenders that would love to do 55% loans and have you layer 10 or 15% on top of that. Um, there are other lenders who, who will not allow mezzanine financing behind them, just a, as a matter of policy. Yeah. It's all over the board with yeah. that. Um, mezzanine lending has changed. Your mezzanine lending used to be for the borrower that didn't have enough money. 
mm-hmm. basically. And, right. and you got your 75% construction loan. I don't have 25% equity. So you went from 75 to 85 with MES financing. Now you find today that sometimes you're going from 60 to 70 with MES financing. I see. Uh, so it, it's, it, it's, it has a different profile, but there are still, there are still s- several lenders that, that just as a matter of policy will not allow mezzanine financing. There are others that will. Well, you know, you give me a comfort level to to hear about that, to see that maybe when the cycle does turn, maybe we're in better shape this time. Oh, I, I would say uh, 100% we are in better shape than we were the last time. Um, supply, while you see a lot of it in the urban core markets, we are not oversupplied in, in most parts of most markets. Um, it's... Uh, the governor on, on the market being being financing, being more equity, being people remember how devastating it was, and it wasn't that long ago. You know, it's you know nine years ago now, mm-hmm. nine to ten years ago now. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of people with long memories on that. They're trying to have that not happen again. Yeah. So what about let's turn to um, existing financing for existing sure. projects. You know, what are you seeing for underwriting there, and what are you seeing for rate trends? Um, you know, underwriting is, is, is still, I would say, fairly straightforward. You know, it's a, it, it's, a, it's a trailing three revenue, trailing 12 other income, trailing 12 expenses underwriting. There's, there's not a lot of funky things going on in underwriting. The, the, most people come to their NOI in a very similar fashion. What they do with that sometimes can be different. Um, but but in but in determining your underwriting NOI, mo- most underwriting shops are are, are, com- are doing a similar process to do that. Um, what you do when you get to that, th- that's where you can find some differences between the agencies, the life company lenders, the conduits. You know, they they may take that NOI number and do some different things with it, which is where you would manifest itself in what you might say someone being more aggressive than someone else is. Yeah, meaning they'll adjust the NOI for their underwriting. Well, it, it, it'll, it'll, it'll be the un, their underwriting standards apply to the NOI as oh, far okay. as debt coverage and okay. debt yield. And, that and, and what kind of debt coverage ratios are, are you seeing from the different um, sources? With rates going up, we're, we're, all, we're almost working our way back to a, a time where 125, 130 becomes a normal debt coverage. You know, in the in the very low rate environment that we existed in for most of the past ten years, mm-hmm. a lot of deals, even at what we would call full leverage, a, a seventy five percent loan, it might have still had a one forty five or one fifty debt cover yeah. because the rate was so low right. on it. Now rates are are getting back to they're still not to historical levels, but they're getting closer, and and that's pushing debt coverage down to what we might call more traditional levels. Yeah, and what about uh, interest rates? What are you seeing the trends there? Um, you know, your rates are are up. Uh, the Treasury rates are up. You know, the, the seven and ten year are both in the mid two eighties right now. Uh, LIBOR is up around, I think, around two ten now, and, and that's in. You know, we had several years of LIBOR, thirty day LIBOR, sitting there at twenty basis points, mm-hmm. almost like it was going to be there forever. Mm-hmm. Well, it wasn't, and it's not. You know, LIBOR is up around two ten now. Spreads are kind of. All over the place in the mid 100s, mid mid to high 100s. Your nominal rates today, for say a, a full loan, which we would call like a 75% loan, maybe an 80% loan on an acquisition, your rates are in the 450 to 470 range. Mm-hmm. If you go down the leverage scale, you know 65, say a 65% loan, mm-hmm. probably takes that to 430 to 450. And you get down into the into the lower leverages, you're getting down more into the 410 to 430 range. What's interesting, those rates would I, I would say are typically kind of agency rates. Mm-hmm. When you get into the lower leverages, then you bring in the life insurance companies, and uh, life insurance companies for especially for high quality multifamily at lower leverage, they will get down and dirty on pricing, yeah. and you start to see rates getting down, you know, more closer to four, four ten. Around there. And what uh, kind of terms are you seeing? Initial terms on these? Uh, it's still it's still generally a ten year loan, twenty five to thirty year AM market. Mm-hmm. One one thing that's interesting, the yield curve is very flat right now. So your 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 additional borrowing cost for say taking a ten year term and expanding that to a twenty year term is very minimal. And so, and especially in the life, I mean, Fannie and Freddie. 
Fannie offers that product. Freddie really doesn't. But Fannie will go out to 30 years if you want. With no balloon, no call. No, no, no call. Nice. The life insurance companies, there are several life insurance companies that like what we call long money. Mm -hmm. They will go 20, 25, 30 years. You yeah. fully amortize And with deals. Fannie, there's no prepayment, right? Uh, no, you're, you're prepayable at least for some portion of all of those deals. Oh, okay. Yes. Even yes. with Fannie. HUD is the one that... On the, there's a very extended term with HUD out, out to 35 years on a refinance deal, and your prepayment is open after 10. Okay. So you have a long period of time with no prepayment penalty. The other deals, there, there is an extended prepayment penalty period on that, on, and that's somewhat negotiable. Mm -hmm. e even, even in the agencies, it's still somewhat negotiable. As so if you want a, a loan with no prepayment penalty, the the, the source is the bank the and banks. they're not competitive? The, um, not, not if you get out to those long terms. The, the, okay. the, the, the swap market is not very efficient today mm -hmm. when you get to the seven and ten year levels. I think a five year swap maybe could still work, but I think it's still going to get you into the fives probably with most lenders. Mm -hmm. But when you get out to seven, ten, especially beyond ten, but when you get out to seven to ten, the swap market's not working very well. So the, the banks kind of fall out at that point on a fixed rate basis. Um, what I was going to say, though, on the, on the life insurance company side, if you decided you you like the rate where we the, the rate environment today, and you wanted to go 20 and 25 years, that financing is available in the life company world. Many lenders looking for that long money right yeah, now. Yeah, and that uh, you're not going to be able to pay that off for a while, right? You you're probably looking at at least prepayment protection through half of the term. Wow. Yeah, uh, that would make otherwise. me a little nervous if I wanted to. To do something. Well, they are assumable. They are assumable. They are assumable, yeah. and, and 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 while no one will put this in writing, mm -hmm. uh, quite often we have the ability to go back to that life company if you wanted to sell your property, mm -hmm. and and let's say that you started out with a 65% loan and mm -hmm. it's amortized down now and it's a 49% loan mm -hmm. and you want to sell it, the lender may be able to ratchet that back up again with a with a a, a coterminous junior loan you know, for your buyer. Be because the paperwork is going to say no to that, not in no secondary. Yeah, the paperwork financing. is is going to bar you from uh, yeah. more uh, bar you from secondary financing. Yeah, uh, it'll allow an assumption, but it will make no promises whatsoever as to getting more money. The reality is. Lenders like to keep their money out at favorable rates. If, yeah. if you've got a, 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 a story that works for them, they'll consider lending you more money or lending your buyer more money. Right. Okay. At the time. Now, and we've all heard about the technology and things are getting more efficient out there in the in commercial real estate world. How about the time to, to get a loan on, say, an existing apartment project today? Is it? Um, changed it it hasn't really changed a whole lot. Uh, we still look you at close the loan in three days, right? Oh, always, always. Yeah, <laughs> at about eighteen percent. Um, no, you know, we still look at, kind of at, at the standard process being sixty days from application of closing. Mm -hmm. uh, we can go faster than that, and the lenders can go faster than that. I will tell you, they usually reserve that speed mm -hmm. for acquisitions yeah. that that are on usually on tighter time frames and time frames with, with pain for not meeting certain benchmarks. Yeah. On your typical refinance though, we still, you still would like to have 60 days application to close. Yeah. Well, the sellers of apartment projects today think 60 days is way too long, Tom. Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of strange things going on <laughs> as, as far as there's, there's more money than there is deals. Yeah. And so when you have a deal that's, that, that's being chased by a lot of people, yeah. you get people going hard Day yeah. one, yeah. you know, no due diligence period on yeah. things. They'll do some what we would think of as kind of crazy things to get a deal tied up. Yeah, today. yeah, so. yeah. We see it mm -hmm. every day. It's uh, kind of amazing. So let's ask a, yeah, about uh, some particular property types, like age restricted over fifty-five. Mm -hmm. uh, how do lenders look at that pro age product? Age restricted um, w without any services and any uh, any funky deed things. Age restricted would be looked at really just as apartments. Okay. Okay. That that is actually a marketing function. Wow. Yeah, all right. That's how you choose to operate your property. Yeah. Okay. Now there may be some design features yeah. in that. A lot of those they, they like one story units. Mm -hmm. They even on a two story property you're going to have an elevator. You know because of that. But that's really apartments. It's where you get into services where independent living, yeah. which is kind of independent living, but it'll have a central cafeteria or, or a meal plan, mm -hmm. you know, that gets into what we would call senior housing. Yeah. And that's a different category. And 
that is a category that tends to be dominated by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Yeah. Uh, and, and HUD also, too. Okay. And how are lenders today looking at student housing? Um, with, uh, with a curious eye, um, there, are, there are several markets in the country that um, have at least a taste of overbuilding. I would say that's mostly in the flagship markets. Uh, you know, and, and, I, and I, I'll describe a flagship market in, in Alabama, that would be Tuscaloosa or Auburn. It, it would not be you know, Troy, all right? It's, it's, it's the big state right. universities that everyone's heard of, okay? Right. Those, those markets have attracted the most capital. Is it, have people heard of that college there? They in have, the US? they have, yes, they have. Yeah, the one in Tuscaloosa. Yeah, yeah Tuscaloosa. Like, I can't remember the name of it. No. But, um, so the, those markets, uh, you have to be careful in those markets. That doesn't mean that there's not new property being done in those markets and being done successfully. Yeah. But from, a, from both a developer and a lender perspective, you really need to understand what you're getting into, your location, dynamics, the dynamics of the, of, of the school, the, the on-campus housing that may or may not be coming online in the school. Um, there may be some actually more opportunities in, in what you might call the second tier schools in a lot of states. However, a lot of lenders uh, don't jump right in in the second tier schools. They like to be in the flagship big university towns, there's a, maybe a bit of a, of a push-pull going on there in that. But you may have some more opportunities in what might be the second-tier cities. Okay. And who would be the best lenders for a couple different property types that the audience may have? So let's say someone's got a, a, a B or maybe even C-plus product. Okay. Okay. Um, depends on leverage. And, and, and that's going to be the answer to a lot of these questions. Okay. okay? At the, at the higher leverage levels in, in I would, what I would call the lower quality tiers, that's probably a CMBS or conduit execution, okay? okay? If you get into the, the B minus C stuff, and as long as the economics work for it, if you're at more modest leverage, that could be a life insurance company. Really? There are, I mean, life insurance companies don't just do double A, super squeaky, shiny stuff, okay? okay? Um, but it, at, at, that, at that level, it could be a life company, at the higher debt levels, it will probably be a CMBS lender. Okay. And then if you have the, the squeaky clean AA? Um, that's, you're going to have all sorts of people chasing that. Yeah. You know, Fannie and Freddie are, are they're, you're going to get the best pricing they have on that. If you're looking for modest leverage, the, the large life insurance companies, the name brands that you would know, you know, mm -hmm. from commercials on television, mm -hmm. they're going to get down and dirty to win that high quality business. It, it, it's very interesting on, on the agency side. It's, it's harder than ever to quote pricing mm -hmm. because it, it, you know, there used to be, we thought of it as a grid and maybe you varied off the grid a little bit. Now we're varying off the grid, you know, to a material way now, and it depends on property quality, borrower quality, the size of the deal, larger deals get more favorable treatment. Mm -hmm. um, but if you, have a, if you have a high quality property with very solid economics on the multifamily sector today, you will have no shortage of people trying to give you financing. Well, if it's my property, obviously it's high quality. It must Tom. be. It must be. <laughs> so what do you tell borrowers today um, about third party reports if, let's say they're doing an acquisition um, they've got a tight time frame. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They want to go ahead and do some due diligence. Um, what do you tell them there? If they want to go out a ahead of time mm -hmm. and, and, and order their own third-party reports, I would talk to a, a mortgage banker before I order anything to try to make sure I'm ordering from a vendor that will be universally acceptable. Okay. Okay. We, we're actually going through a, a situation right now where where they thought they had one that was, and they found out that it wasn't, and so we had to go order new reports. Borrower was not very happy about that, but they had gone out and ordered their own reports. Um, time frame wise, uh, appraisals, uh, we can get appraisals done in a couple weeks today. Uh, we're gonna pay a little more for that, but when I say we pay a little more, that little more is a rounding error in, in the size of, in the overall transaction size. Yeah. Uh, two weeks is, is pushing it. We, we generally, when we get a, a two-week appraisal, I will tell you it probably has a little more back and forth with the appraiser after that. They, they've, they've gone extraordinarily fast you know, in order to get this stuff done. Yeah. You go really fast, you might miss something, you may make a mistake somewhere. Uh, on, on, on the environmental engineering, 
the other third party reports, two weeks is a very standard there. Okay. You know, that's become, especially on the environmental side, that, that's, a, that's, those reports are done on computer more than anything else today. Yeah. Two weeks is standard for those. Appraisers would love to have three and four weeks. Sometimes on an acquisition, you just don't have that time, and we can get them done in, in two, certainly done in three, sometimes done in two, you're just gonna pay a little more for it. Most of your lenders require surveys? Yes, and that's a state-specific thing, and quite often depends on the title company. Mm -hmm. If they will insure on an old survey, then a lot of lenders won't make you get a new survey. Uh, the ability to do that varies in, on, based on state law. Uh, lenders are usually, they try to help you, if they can on that, to not have you go spend a whole lot of money. Uh, they, they all do have their standards, and they're, and they're not going to come off those standards. But if they can help you by using an old survey or getting an old survey updated, they will try to help you. Is there a way that someone in the audience could know if the, the third-party vendors that they like to use mm -hmm. uh, would be on the approved list of a lot of these lenders? Just call a mortgage bank. Okay. Uh, th that's the easiest way to do that. Uh, yeah. you, you know, rather than calling... 30 life insurance companies, mm -hmm. you call one me, <laughs> right. Uh, all right, and I can, I can give you a pretty good idea who the, who the universally acceptable people are. Yeah, so. okay. What uh, tip would you leave the audience with, Tom, related to financing today? Um, be early. Don't, don't, don't wait too long. Uh, while we can do things in very tight time frames, and we do some amazing things in tight time frames, that doesn't really benefit hardly anybody <laughs> yeah. at all. Especially you the know. borrower. Yes. You know, you know, <laughs> Do things on, on a timely basis, allow enough time to get things done. On acquisitions, don't wait until you sign your purchase and sale agreement to say, oh, what are we gonna do about financing now, <laughs> all right? Yeah. Be engaged early on that. Most mortgage bankers will, will be happy to spec some time for you, to give you an idea on what your deal might look like if you bought it for this amount of money. Um, use use that service that's available. Just don't don't wait too long. Yeah, well, that's a good tip. And you know, I can tell you, as a broker, you know, we're getting a lot of interested buyers in properties. And and w as a broker, we need to know how you're financing it and funding it. And we want to talk to your lender. I want to sure. see how far down the road you are, uh, or you might not win the deal. Yeah. Uh, so I would imagine, as a broker, if yeah. if my if my buyer told me. They were going to need financing, and mm -hmm. you asked them what's their process look like, and they went, uh, you know. <laughs> I, they probably would not give you a really good feeling about their right. viability as a buyer. <laughs> That's right, Tom. Great. Thanks for your information as great as you. Uh, always always a us. pleasure to be here. All right, and thank you for being with us. Stay with us, though. We'll have some more on the multifamily market. I'm Michael Bull. This is America's Commercial Real Estate Show.